So this is the sixth lecture in Anthropology 202, Human Evolution. In this lecture, we want to discuss the genus Homo. To kind of begin, if you think about the last lecture, we explored the archaeological evidence for early human evolution. We talked about right the upper Paleolithic, really from uh, the development of agriculture back to 50,000 years before present. We talked about the middle P P Paleolithic, right, from 50,000 years to 300,000 years before present. And then we talked about the lower Paleolithic, which is from 300,000 years to 3 million years before present. And in that discussion, we talked about the fact that when we're looking at this archaeology, there is a variety of archaic physical forms of Homo sapiens and that differentiating them from extinct ancient species like Homo erectus becomes difficult for anthropologists. As we move back in time to before we find any presence of evidence of Homo sapiens, we really begin to explore our genus and several extinct species that are classified as ancestral to us. And so you can see there right on the, the timeline with modern and archaic humans. And then from before that, you begin to see other species, right, within the genus Homo. Um, and these ancestral species in the genus Homo are the subject for today's lecture. If we were to continue going back then from the last lecture, uh, we would begin to talk about a species known as Homo heidelbergensis. Now, this species is not considered to be in our direct evolutionary line, but it is controversial and people argue um, one way or the other. It's clear that there was a split with a common human ancestor approximately 300 to 500,000 years before the present, and that this particular species had a cranial capacity slightly smaller than the archaic humans that we saw in that last lecture. They had a cranial capacity of 1,200 cubic centimeters. Classic fossil, as you see there, is from Tauteville, France, and is dated 450,000 years ago by stratigraphy. This particular species migrated extensively throughout Africa, East Asia, and Europe, and we have an extensive set of remains at Atapuerca uh, in Spain. In Europe, Homo heidelbergensis, as you can see, evolved into Homo neanderthalensis and then went extinct and is likely have interbred with Homo sapiens as we've discussed. rather more recently discovered a species that we don't really understand very much about. Its relationship to Habilis is uncertain, has a similar cranial capacity, um, other similar aspects of anatomy, but it actually did live relatively late and coexisted with humans. We have evidence of it uh, living as late as two to 300,000 years before present. Um, the classic fossil example from Rising Star Cave in South Africa, which was dated by Electric Spin Residence, and, and as well, two different um, dating methods, the Uranium Thorium dating as well, um, in addition to Electric Spin Residence. If you then keep going back, we see the Homo erectus or Homo ergaster, um, both of those names are currently being argued for two closely um, related species, if you're a lumper, or if you're a splitter, as we talked about, two distinct but closely related species. And for Homo erectus and ergaster, probably emerged around 1.8 million years before present in, in Africa, and then very, very quickly it radiated into Asia, where we've learned about Homo florensias at the beginning of the course, um, the hobbit, as they say, there in Southeast Asia, 
and this would be, right, the ancestral species. So Homo erectus and Homo ergaster are ancestors, if you will, of Homo heidelbergensis. And with Homo erectus, we have the first fully bipedal hominid. So the first uh, hominid that is going to use bipedal locomotion like uh, anatomically modern Homo sapiens do today. And you can kind of see this in the pelvis. The pelvis is, has a narrowing from more ancestral species that have a broader pelvis uh, and who use different forms of locomotion. And we also find the lower limb lengthening that we associate with bipedalism. Uh, the upper limbs are still fairly long, but that changes as well through time. Now, Homo erectus had a, a brain approximately 900 cubic centimeters. So it's, it's large relative to, let's say, other uh, primates, right? But in relationship to archaic or modern Homo sapiens, it's quite a bit smaller. It has a bit less sexual dimorphism than, than humans, so a little less distinction between male and female um, fossils. And we believe they lived in groups and used fire. So, you know, despite the, the cranial capacity here, uh, we do believe that this was a social uh, primate and it was a primate that used fire, had some degree of control over fire. Classic example that you see there is Turkanaboy, um, dated by stratigraphy to around 1.4 million years before present. And it's cr quite an amazing fossil. It's one of the most intact early um, hominids from the genus Homo that we, that we have there. One of the things that I wanted to introduce in this particular lecture, my background is in cultural and linguistic anthropology. And so you will notice that I'm not always using the lexicon, right, of a physical anthropologist or Greco-Latin, right, scientific lexicon. I'm using everyday expressions and terms, right, for some of these technical uh, lexifers. And so I wanted to give you, though, I wanted to introduce, right, that lexicon in this lecture. It's a good moment to note how physical anthropologists study human biology, their close observation, and their range of vocabulary for many of the uh, aspects, right, of human anatomy that aren't in our everyday language, that in everyday life we simply aren't used to making reference, right, to um, human skeletal anatomy, for example, as a physical anthropologist might. Physical anthropologists have to use close observation to be able to differentiate, right, human and non-human um, fossil evidence, mo anatomically modern Homo sapiens, and other hominids. And then as we move, you know, beyond Homo sapiens, right, one species within the genus Homo from another. And so to kind of capture this, uh, I want you to listen to Dr. Ann Zeller from the University of Waterloo continue to describe some aspects of Homo erectus that we haven't discussed today. This particular individual, although he doesn't have a face, is Homo erectus from Java, from the Jetus or Jetus beds, at about 1.6 million years. The features about this that distinguish it from the Australopithecus are first of all that the cranium was considerably larger. It wasn't larger, that much larger than Homo habilis because it's about 800 to 850 cubic centimeters, but it's certainly larger than Australopithecus. Also, the view from the back shows that the line for muscle attachment is not quite as rugged, but is somewhat higher, indicating that the shape of the skull as it sat on the spine is a little different. Perhaps there was more muscularity. Also, when you look at this skull from the rear, whoops, it does come apart. Um, when you look at it from the rear, you can see that it is a little bit narrower across the bottom than it is a little higher up. In other words, the view from the rear is not the same bell shape as you had in Australopithecus, but more what we call a house shape, a situation where it comes out fairly straight and then slopes in with a sort of ridged area across, along the top here. The view of the occiput from the side shows this angulation and this uh, bulge here and the flat angulation at the bottom are very characteristic of most of the Homo erectus skulls that you find. 
This Java specimen also has extremely thick bone. You can see here that the thickness of the bone in the skull is far greater than the thickness was in either the Australopithecus or in any of the modern forms. This form, in spite of the fact that it is the same time period as the one from Africa, is, uh, appears to be somewhat more primitive. The African one from that time period, we have a little bit more of it, more of its face. You can see it's got the face region and also quite a large, fairly well-rounded skull. In particular, the skull is better rounded at the back and the area for the muscle attachment is somewhat smaller and not so high up so that when you hold it upright, the maximum breadth of the skull, length of the skull is somewhat lower and not quite so pronounced. It also has a f flattish area on the, under the back here for muscle attachment, but it's certainly not as flat and pronounced as was, was the case in the Java skull. When you look at it from the front, you can see that it has quite a wide face, although a lot of this one is filled in, but wide eyes and wide nasal opening. It also has fairly pronounced supraorbital torus, or eyebrow ridges. These eyebrow ridges are not very thick in this dimension, but they extend out this way a fair length. Perhaps you can see it there. You see how they come out like that. Another feature that you can see from this form by holding it up to the side is that the nasal bones actually protrude a little bit. Um, Homo erectus, you can see that the face itself is not as protruding, especially in the jaw region, as was the case in that Australopithecus. It does, however, have reasonably large temporal fossa for the muscles that work the jaw to come through. And this comes up and attaches on the top of the skull. You can see that there are small ridges for attachment of the muscle right along here. However, it does not come up to the center line of the skull, as is the case in some of the more robust Australopithecus. Here, you can see the line quite well right there for the attachment of the jaw muscles. Another very important Homo erectus specimen from Africa is this one which is called the fossil boy, which also dates from about 1.6 million years ago. The reason why this particular one is so important is because it's of an immature individual. And we can actually tell that it's an immature individual by looking at his teeth. His, only his 12-year molars have erupted, and his canine teeth are still immature teeth and not those of an adult. We also got almost the whole skeleton of this individual, which is a really important thing because now we can actually look at the length of the arms and legs in proportion to each other. This was an immature individual. The epiphyses aren't closed yet, and yet he's already five foot four tall and may have matured as much as five foot ten. So this is very important information about the development of bipedalism in early hominids. Moving into China, we have forms that are the same age as this trineal specimen, about 0.7 million years old, but I don't have any casts of those because there aren't very many of them available. However, between 0.6 and 0.4 million years was a very famous cave, a cave called Chikutian, or what the Chinese nowadays call Zukujian. And this is the cave where Davidson Black originally found the Homo erectus. Now, this is a very much reconstructed specimen. These forms in the cave were frequently there because the roof fell in on them, and so most of them were in very tiny pieces. However, we have this reconstructed skull and face of what may have been a female. Now here you have a form that really looks very much more like a human being. You have the proportion of head to face that is more similar to that which we are used to. The head of this particular specimen is about 1,225 cubic centimeters. You can see that it does have brow ridges across the front here, which uh, is characteristic of Homo erectus, but they are smaller than the brow ridges in the later African form, and for the size of the individual, they are actually reduced over what was the case with the trineal specimen. As far as the overall shape of the skull goes, you still have this elongation of the skull with the occipital region having a protuberance here, the maximum length of the skull, and the fairly flat bottom section of the occiput here. There's a still some post-orbital constriction, from the jaw muscles coming up beside the skull here, but it's not quite as marked as was the case previously. Another feature that I haven't mentioned yet is the fact that a number of these Homo erectus skulls have a thickening of bone down the midline here. This is often called a sagittal keel. The face region, once again mainly reconstructed, you can see that there's a fairly wide face with the zygoma coming out reasonably straight. 
The nose is quite large, and one of the features that is also characteristic of the faces of Homo erectus when we have them is that this bridge to the nose is quite evident. In the Australopithecus specimens, the, the nose bridge was not very evident from a side view. It was sort of flat in with the face, and then the whole face sloped out. Whereas here we have the bridge of the nose, and then we have some protrusion of the jaw part of the mouth. This is often called alveolar prognatism, or forward protrusion of the jaw. So then if we go beyond the Homo erectus, the next species that we would find that goes uh, further back in time, probably ancestral, right, to erectus, we see Homo habilis back to 2.6 million years before present. So very early species in the genus. Small cranial capacity, so about 640 um, cubic centimeters, rather than the 400 that we might find, let's say, among a, a chimpanzee, but we're getting more equivalent in, in terms of brain capacity with that of a, a chimp. And we find the very simplest stone tools. And a classic example that you see there is from Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. So if we look at the genus Homo, we step back, we look at it as a whole, a couple of very important trends and traits that are of value, right, in trying to understand human evolution. Once we go beyond Homo sapiens, our species, and we look at some of the ancestral species in that archaeological record, we see this trend of an increase in brain capacity. We saw that, right, um, all the way up to the Homo heidelbergensis. We also see a dependence on intelligence, right, and we see uh, even though we're seeing a simpler tool set here, we're seeing other uh, important phenomena such as the use of controlled fire. And then anatomically, one of the um, clearest trends, right, is the decrease in face proportions, right, particularly the protuberance, right, the uh, brow ridges and then the protuberance of the mouth and nose region we see the decrease in the size of the jaws. This is a large trend, right, that we saw all the way up into archaic uh, Homo sapiens and then into uh, anatomic modern Homo sapiens. That trend actually uh, can be seen through anatomically modern humans, right, into the domestication of plants and animals.